please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello and welcome to Big Deal. Now this is the first episode in the new year 2018 and the year calls for uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code resolutions. In fact, this whole year really belongs on the deal street to the IBC led resolutions. How is that really panning out? Are the executions as easy as we see or they look like on the paper at this moment? And what could be the various hurdles that IBC process that face in this particular year? We have two experts joining us, Abizar as well as Nilang, who are there on the thick of action there and working on these transactions, getting us all the details on what are the various challenges that we could be facing as far as the MA or the actual acquisitions through the IPC process is concerned. Abizar, starting with you, now we have seen many MA transactions. This particular process is a new animal altogether. It is not like a usual mergers and acquisitions. What are the various changes and differences that you see which we are new to and which could be difficult to execute? So many actually. One is here the seller is not the person running the business. Yeah. Here the seller is a creditor, a banker. Uh, so that in fact is a very big difference and we can kind of dive into it later in the show as to what is different in that. Uh, but the seller is not the person who can give any reps and warranties. Yes. So that's something that we need to be aware of, how you kind of build these reps and warranties in. Mm. Second is that first time ever, mm. thanks to Section 29A, where promoters now cannot bid for their companies, India will have hostile takeovers. Yes. So you have situations where uh, the promoter is not going to be allowed to bid, mm. uh, somebody else is going to be bidding for this business, and effectively it is some kind of a hostile turnover, though, yeah. The difference is that there is an IP in between who's been managing the company for yeah. uh, a 270 day or 180 day period before it gets sold. Yeah. That's second. Third, and more importantly, is that in India or in every other country, there is a process by which uh, a definitive term sheet comes in and then there are conditions precedent. And the conditions precedent in India, because of multiple approvals required, may take much longer. Yeah. So mostly the deals will get over by the stipulated period under which an IBC uh, uh, insolvency professional is in control of the business. Right. But the deal closure in terms of definitive documentation may extend way beyond it. Right. So we will find a lot of issues, operational issues of how we'll actually be managing the situation. So these are All the two, three things which are which are very difficult to deal with. All right, so let's dive into them one by one. And Nilan, mm -hmm. coming to you, as far as bid process is concerned, there is a big lacuna when it comes to the expectations <coughs> of the buyers and uh, also the sellers. Now, how do we see the bid process which has just about begun? Are we really getting the bids which the lenders really like? And do you think that they would be executed into final transactions as well? Well, <coughs> on the latter question, I certainly hope so. Um, I, I think in some sense, while the IBC process is a very different process from the M&A process, in many ways it's not dissimilar in the sense that there will always be a gap between what the buyers and the sellers want. Mm. And we will see the same gap over here. Mm. The important thing is how is that gap bridged, right? Um, in a normal M&A process, you have a seller who knows what his value is, he knows how to go about his business, he's selling what he owns, he's selling what he knows. As Abhizar pointed out over here, the seller actually is not the owner. Yeah. It's a committee of creditors, it's a committee of disparate banks, it's an IP, etc. I think time will develop a certain amount of understanding and process and intelligence on how to run this process, how to get the best deal. Mm. We may find in the initial deals that <coughs> there's a little bit of difficulty in bridging that gap. Mm. But I think that learning will come and, and it's coming very soon. The one thing we're seeing in India is because of the forced timelines of the IBC, the learning quotient, the learning curve is phenomenal. Mm. Everyone, lawyers, bankers, accountants, in investment bankers in the process are learning at a pace but never seen before. Each passing day, everybody is just learning the process of IBC as I understand and also uh, getting accustomed to this uh, process as well. So obviously these are not deal makers who are handling the situations. How is that panning out? So they're not, they're bankers. Hmm. Uh, but see the thing is that what, what one needs to do, so obviously there's a gap. Now I'll, I'll, so IBC there have been many few, very few resolutions. So we had Sharon Biotech which, uh, which was a resolution. Hmm. We had Kohinoor which was a resolution where we had an ARC bid. And Sharon Biotech uh, surprisingly enough, the bondholders bid and took the company over. Which is you know, unique yes. in India frankly. Yes. Uh, but now if you, if you look at a situation like, uh, you know, we have not seen too many of the larger cases come up. Yeah. But we have seen some of the larger cases in SDR which is very similar to an IBC. And where, where we see the gap hmm. is that 
people need to have two orientations. Yes. One is, as Nihang said, that the promoter who's selling the business in a normal MA knows the value of his business. The hmm. banker will need to develop in knowledge of what is the value of that business. Hmm. Hmm. And I think it's not that difficult to do. Because he, because he has an IP. But today. more than a dozen lenders, right. is decision making going to be difficult? Because everybody has different expectations also on the seller's side. So I agree. So the orientation that needs to change is that lenders today are still in recovery mode. Hmm. They need to get into an enterprise value mode. Hmm. First of all, that's a big difference. Then I think once they move to that mindset, gaining a consensus on op enterprise value is not that difficult. Then hmm. it's slicing the cake to each person's uh, credit exposure, which is different. Hmm. But I think the first thing where we need to do is that understand what the enterprise value is. That will give us an appreciation of where we come from. Hmm. And then as Dilang said, like any normal M&A process, when the bids come in, we need to look at bridging the gap between what is our perception of an enterprise value hmm. and what is the quotation. Hmm. So I think that process has been weak even in an, SD, in an SDR situation, you've seen that. I think if banks develop a specific cell to deal with these large assets, and you're talking about you know, 200 plus billion dollars, so I'm sure it you know, justifies every bank having a sell enough hmm. to deal with these M&As. Hmm. And they will gain expertise, they will talk to lawyers, talk to people like us, everybody else, and gain the kind of knowledge about respective businesses hmm. and know how to do the deals. That's missing right now? All right. So Nilang, uh, talking about the bid process, are we getting the bids which could really fructify into uh, deals? And do you think that all the IBC cases would have demand from buyers and they will all, uh, you know, end up in a resolution at the end of 270 days? Um, we're at a stage right now where there are, for the larger companies, we're just beginning to get bids. So yeah. there is a promise of favorable bids, yeah. not least because a lot of them are very competitive and a, an enhanced competition is likely to bring better bids. Uh, the smaller cases where there have been resolutions I don't think are a good barometer to judge where yeah. the bigger cases will go. So I think there is enough promise, number yeah. one. Um, and the kind of thinking that has gone in by the applicants, the kind of investment that has been made by these applicants is, is very heartening because it shows that they're all very keenly interested okay. in, in giving a very sensible bid. Um, I don't know if Abhizad has anything to add over here, but... Oh, uh, yeah, like any M&A process, there, first of all, there will be dud companies here, yeah. and there will be great franchises here. Now, if you look at the top 12 companies, some of the steel companies that are there, they have yeah. excellent plants. They are plants which have been built over a number of years. Have so got they have all great the demand. They've got the da they yes. great demand. Yes. Then you look at you look at the second drug companies. Yeah. If companies have cash flows which are scalable within the existing capacities, mm. there will be demand. Yes. And why are the why why I'm talking about scalable? Because due to lack of working capital, these companies have actually shrunk in terms of their uh, their mm. profitability and cash flows. Right. So there's an ability that within the current uh, level of capacities, earnings can be grown. Right. So just by providing working capital, earnings can grow. So if those situations are there, there will be demand. Now, yeah. There will be assets which are completely rusted and done. Right. But there will be no demand. Okay. So, it's like, I mean, so we are okay with the fact that some of the assets will see resolution, some of them won't. It's market driven, right. I think. Okay. I yeah. think there are some assets demand. which are calling for value. All right. So like a proper M&A transaction. So for banks, here. actually, yes. they should take the decision whether Sarfesi or IBC Yes. Based on where they are on the on the underlying franchise. So if yes. there is a franchise value, I would go for an IBC. Yes. If there is an asset value, I'd rather do Sarfacey and sell the asset. The one thing to keep in mind, though, is we are seeing a, a, a bit of a golden period for the stressed asset area in India because mm. the stressed asset industry worldwide is quite cool. Mm. And yeah. therefore, a lot of this money worldwide is actually looking at India mm. very, very keenly. Yes. So we're seeing an increased amount of demand huh. than we would have maybe three years ago or four years ago. Are there any uh, important issues being raised by the bidders when it comes to the contingent liabilities and other such factors as well? So Yes, so off-balance sheet items, there are clearly issues mm. uh, in a sense. But so, so let's deal with contingent liabilities and uh, reps and warranties separately. Mm. Mm. So contingent liabilities are like any other M&A. Mm. Right? You have to take a call on them. Yeah. So if there's a large Supreme Court case overhanging your particular acquisition. Mm. You have to take a call whether you're going to abide mm. by it, whether you think it's right, it's not mm. right. Mm. Uh, I think that that is contingent liability wise, mm. it's kind of understood. Mm. Uh, there are tax claims, etc., mm. where people may want to say that you know if there have been past uh, errors, am I going to be willing to pay liabilities for it? Mm. They may be able to cap some of those through a, through a resolution plan which can get approved to say, I'm not going to be responsible for the past delays, but if there are any delays going forward, I'll certainly pay for it. Mm. So that's the second, I think that those kind of exceptions can be dealt with in the resolution plan. Mm. Otherwise, I generally think that if there are contingencies which people are not able to decide on, mm. 
hmm. they will fall back onto the sustainable debt of the organization. So they will be reduced from the sustainable debt of the organization and kept aside as a contingency. Hmm. And as and when that contingency fructifies or doesn't fructify, hmm. that amount will be paid back to the lenders. So that's, I think, the structure. But this is adding to the matter. complication and uncertainty in these deal Certainly. making as well. Certainly. All right. Uh, Nilanga also talking about uh, uh, the new buyers. They are inheriting the promoter's guarantee as well. So what happens to that and what are the gray areas there that uh, have been talked about and that still needs clarity? Well, to be fair, uh, the new buyer is not so much inheriting the promoter guarantee. The existing lenders may have the benefit of calling on those promoter guarantees in some cases. Okay. To the extent they do, there's some question as to whether the new buyers will have to pay out the old promoters because of the subrogation. Yeah. And I think the answer is fairly clear, at least to lawyers, we'll yeah. see how jurisprudence develops, yeah. that uh, the existing uh, promoter guarantee subrogation rights can be curtailed or crammed down in the resolution plan process hmm. by the new buyers. So the new buyers shouldn't really suffer from any subrogation call hmm. by the existing promoters. All right, so these are about the new buyers, but uh, these are the most uh, you know, controversial topic has also been uh, the promoters themselves not being able to bid, though some of the relaxations have been made that if they pay their dues, and uh, also uh, the, uh, the you know, 29A and how that really uh, plays out over here in terms of promoters really going or somebody acting jointly or acting in concert. So, uh, of course, Nilan can speak better on that, but I'll just tell you a commercial point of view. Commercially, frankly, promoters can't bid for the companies. It's, it's absolutely clear now. The only exception to that rule is that if you're able to pay all the overdues amount up front, which I find hard, uh, find very really difficult for any promoter to actually pay up. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, he effectively is gifting to the other promoters all his overdue payments for them to be bid more, to be able to bid more competitively. So, so I don't all think that we're hearing that. about certain promoters really paying up the dues so that they are part and there's one large steel asset which is being talked about more than the others in this respect. So that is undoable is what you're saying? Well, if, if the government stand is very clear right now that you need to first pay the dues and then bid. Mm. But if, if that interpretation is relaxed to say that you can pay the amount in an escrow account and if you win, that amount shall be adjusted immediately. That's not said. That, that's not said. But I'm saying if that, I think the, the whole presumption is on the expectation that that will be allowed. Mm. I think. Because if, if that is not allowed, frankly, why would anybody give the amount? So that's mm. commercially. Huh. But otherwise, Section 29 nuances maybe Nilang would but be But legally, a, where do we stand, Nilang? Is there any gray area there as well which needs clarity? Or we are pretty clear that uh, it's undoable, even though there, it, these, these clauses have been relaxed, it's undoable for a promoter to really bid for its own assets. Well, so two points there. Uh, um, I mean, everyone's calling this is the, the, the promoter ordinance and the promoter 29A. The thinking really is that you're right. Most promoters are being banned. It's not. It's not intended to go towards promoters. It's intended to go towards certain classes of people mm -hmm. who have done things which uh, I do not make them credible anymore. Mm. Um, if it happens to be promoters, well, so be it. Mm. Um, in terms of promoters uh, being able to come back in by paying the amount, there is that enabling clause. The law is fairly clear. Mm. Uh, the implementation is difficult. Yeah. How will these promoters pay? Will they pay, as Abhis has said, in an escrow account, mm. and then the banks can take that if the promoter wins? That's not what the law says at all, and that's not what the interpretation is at all. Mm. Will the promoter infuse equity? Well, if they do, then the insolvency professional can't pay that cash out to the banks because he's not permitted to. Mm. Uh, will the promoter pay directly to the banks? Well, if he does, then he becomes a creditor, and technically he could lose 20, 30, 40 percent of that if he loses the bid, which mm. is the fastest way to lose thousands of crores. Uh, in the history of time, really. Mm. Uh, so I think the law is clear, but the implementation is close to impossible. So basically, none of the promoters can bid for their own assets. That is our understanding at the moment. When, I, when you say none of the promoters, none of the promoters who suffer from these ineligibilities, not, it's not all promoters. Even, even if they pay their overdues, which you think is not defined and is undoable in terms of real payment and then being part of the When I say undoable, business. I mean practically undoable, yeah, that's right. All right. So we've discussed what the promoters can do, what, but acting in concert, that's another thing that I wanted to know, jointly and acting in concert. Is there lack of clarity uh, there as well, or is that well defined? It's not defined. Mm. Um, I don't think there's lack of clarity because lawyers um, can look to other jurisprudence in India mm. to get a sense of what those terms mean. Mm. But looking to other jurisprudence inevitably means that you're then analogizing, you're extrapolating into this law, which is going to lead to uncertainty for the next few months until there is clearer jurisprudence 
on that from the NCLTs. Yeah. So I think we will be in situations where there will be people on the fringes of what it means to be jointly acting or mm -hmm. acting in concert, and people will find it difficult to take a call, and likely people will take a more conservative call, which is going to make it that much more complicated for bidders, but equally for the, uh, the COC and the resolution professionals, because they eventually have to be comfortable that the person's acting in concert or not tainted, because eventually they'll suffer the losses <coughs> if someone is tainted. Uh, so to speak, mm. uh, the bid, it's mm. accepted, and then at some later stage it's challenged and overturned. So mm. everyone needs to be more careful, everyone's going to be more cautious. So mm. the uncertainty at the moment, uh, because there is no jurisprudence to explain this or proper definition, is going to have a bit of an impact on the process. So Abhizar, uh, there's every likelihood that many more amendments could be required, some of the new RBI guidelines could also come as we go on the way of IBC process at every stage where we face hurdles. I think, yeah, depending on how we face some of the hurdles, sort of the obvious ones are the what happens after the 270 days, or, mm. you know, or what happens on the, the, on the, on the um, mm. person acting in consort. Mm. So I think some of these laws will get clarified as we move along mm. uh, in the best of intent of what has been largely agreed. Is there a list of areas where we need a clarity and uh, that has been sought by the people who are working in this? Oh, that's a IBC. constant. Uh, there are enough work groups who are coming up with a lot of issues hmm. around clarity, around tax, around, you know. Hmm. So many things are not clarified today. I I'll give you another example. The law allows you to write down the capital completely. Right. Now, how do you write down a capital in a listed company hmm. where it is not allowed to get delisted? Hmm. So can you actually hold? Does 25% need to be held by the public even otherwise? So SEBI right. has not given an exception. Right. So the view is that there are many such amendments which will come as we go along, mm -hmm. as we see the process. But I think there are many larger issues to be dealt with, things like contingencies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like extension of periods, mm -hmm. and those kind of issues. Or, or the banks actually being able to evaluate the bids uh, in a proper manner and, uh, and have a proper negotiation on some of these deals. So I think those are, are larger issues that we will dealt with. Too. Right. Right. There's an insolvency law committee which has already been formed by the government to look at the amendments, amendments. from the learnings of the last year, which is phenomenal uh, in the sense that the government has been very proactive in forming this committee. Uh, and in fact, the various suggestions which have come in are very sensible. As uh, Visa points out, there are various committees. There's a lot of interest, a lot of activity, mm. a lot of thought going on in the IBC space, which means a lot of very sensible recommendations are coming in. So we will see in the first quarter, maybe in the second quarter, mm. some very useful amendments to the IBC. Mm. But what's also important to keep in mind is it's remarkable how reactive and in some cases proactive the government has been in this space. That even I have been very surprised oh. at. Yes, yes. throughout this process. Very encouraging. Yes. From the government, from the judiciary, from the regulators, it's, it's very, very heartening. So we are in for many more changes which will really uh, clear the path and smoothen the path for IBC it seems. As far as the entire process completion is concerned, Abhizar, Anyways, normal transactions take one, one and a half years to actually convert from the time we conceptualize it. Okay. 270 days, is it a realistic target? Or do we think that we will just be about uh, coming up with a definitive agreement and the actual process completion may take much longer than that and therefore the money coming in to the banks which they're really looking forward to as part of the resolution would take much longer than anticipated by the markets. Well, that's true. The actual physical cash may come in later. I think what 270 days will achieve certainty as to who the buyer is uh, subject to of course conditions precedent. Some of them will be external approvals. There's competition commission. There is uh, many other authorities which actually govern some of these companies mm -hmm. like minerals and mining, telecom authority, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think those approvals obviously will take time to come. Mm -hmm. And deals in India have taken year, year and a half to complete. Right. So I think there will be a process uh, beyond 270 days that will happen. Mm -hmm. But there will, be, there will not be another bidding process beyond 270 days for sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, we hope, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the issue today the government has to deal with technicality is that what happens, who runs the company mm. after do the day 270 yeah. uh, until uh, the takeover by the company by the new bidder. Right. And I think that is, that's a big gap that we have today. Yeah, and there again, uh, some, some relaxation, some changes have been sought uh, or, or is there any, any solution or no well, inside? Thinking is going around as to what to do, but you know what, what the government also does not want to do and really appreciate that is that they don't want to uh, vitiate the 270-day sanctity. 
Right. Because you know this can go on and on. These extensions can go on and on. Mm. I think what they need to come up with is the protection to the IP to continue in his fiduciary capacity mm. until the closure of the deal, provided there is a binding term sheet by day 270. Okay, one important question. In the interest of the business, underlying business which is getting sold, if the IP has to continue holding on to the business for time immemorial, more than a year, year and a half, what <coughs> happens to the business? Because IP is not basically an operational expert in this particular case? The job of an IP is to maintain uh, status quo and reasonably run the business. His, his, it's not his profile or his brief to grow the business phenomenally. Hmm. But as long as he can maintain the value of the enterprise through the period of the IBC and until a period takes over, I think that's good enough. That can happen. Hmm. I don't think that will uh, that'll get impacted. All right, so one uh, question mark still remains on the business and how it grows and how it sustains while the whole sale process also continues because there are many approvals to be taken and uh, many hurdles that we need to cross in the IBC. Okay, gentlemen, this discussion is ongoing. I'm sure over the next 270 days, we will continue to come up with newer uh, topics to discuss on this. But as of now, thanks so much for joining us and giving your expert take. We'll have to see how uh, the regulatory framework really reacts to each of the hurdles faced in deal making while the IBC led processes are on so there could be many changes that we will see along our way and we'll get you more experts on each of those topics as we get along with the IBC process and that 270 day period as well with that it's a wrap on uh, this edition of big deal stay tuned for more on CNBC TV 18